Growing up, there were days where I would go to bed hungry because there wasn't enough money to buy food. Uh, when you're young, you really don't know any different. You don't know whether you're poor or you're rich until you're older and you understand those things. One thing I've noticed that those people that were better off in high school uh, or middle school haven't really done much with their life. Those that struggle more are doing a lot more with their lives today than they were able to do before. Welcome back to another episode of the We Live to Build podcast. I'm here today with Glenn Bimani, the owner and CEO of BPS Security, which provides elite security officers as well as alarm systems and monitoring services. So thank you for taking the time to talk with me, Glenn. I appreciate it. Today, we're going to be talking about the psychology of entrepreneurs, and we're going to go a little bit into your background, which uh, has poverty in it, and how that was a driving factor for you for starting your business, among other things. So why don't you tell everyone a little bit more about BPS Security and a little bit of your background, and then we'll go a little bit deeper. So my name is Glenn B. Money. I am the owner of BPS Security, and we are the standard, of uh, the standard in the security guard industry. We started providing security services to small companies, and now we only provide services to large corporations. And uh, we're able to do that because we take very good care of our employees and we pay them well above uh, living wages. And that's what has allowed us to provide a very stable service that the clients are looking for. Okay. And I know you mentioned on the other interview we did, but I'd like you to mention here as well. What was it that uh, actually caused you to start this company? Like the thing that happened right before then? Um, the reason I started this company was because I was passed up for promotion. And the company that passed me up for promotion told me to train the person that was going to take over that promotion. And I told them, well, if I'm not good enough for the position, then I'm not good enough to train your guy. And I put my two weeks notice and I quit. Great. That's a very classic case of being an entrepreneur, I would say. It's kind of mm -hmm. like, well, I want to do this thing and you won't let me, so screw it. I'm going to do it on my own. Actually, that that's how I started my first company. I was living in China and I had applied to speak at TEDx and I was rejected. And so I said, screw it. I'm going to make my own TEDx. And I did. And it was an amazing experience. I did it for two years. So let's go back a little bit further. You had mentioned to me in our last conversation that you grew up poor. So why don't we talk a little bit about what your childhood was like? And uh, if we can, we could discuss the psychology a little bit of that. So growing up, there were days where I would go to bed hungry because there wasn't enough money to buy food. Uh, sometimes we were warming up water in the stove because the water heater broke and we couldn't afford to fix it right away. Uh, so that's kind of like what I grew up with. Uh, when you're young, that's all you know. You really don't know any different. You don't know whether you're poor or you're rich until you're older and you understand those things. And it took a while. Once I was a teenager, I realized those that had businesses were better off than those that didn't, especially in my hometown. Uh, since that time, that's when I knew I wanted to own and operate my own business so I can get ahead in life. So you were born in America, right? Yes. And you, be you believe you're uh, near Austin or Houston? Right now? Uh, I'm in San Antonio right now. San Antonio. Were you born in San Antonio? No, I was born in Laredo, Texas. Okay. So you said that when you were younger, you didn't know that you were poor. But did you have any sort of an idea that the other people, I guess, at your school or in your neighborhood, were they all in a similar situation as you? Or how did you? No, they were not. It wasn't until I got to the later stages of middle school and high school that I started to realize that they were more taken care of than I was. What were some of the things that you noticed that told you that they were in this better situation than you? Uh, the clothing. Uh, they had new clothes more often as well as shoes. And they seem to be able to go out with their friends more often to uh, the restaurants and stuff like that. Okay. So I've, I've heard that and I've never 
I've never been in this situation, so I'm I'm not aware of it. But I've heard that poverty breeds necessity. That basically you find ways to um, make things work. You know, you you kind like how do I say this? Let's say a hundred years ago, you know, my grandfather or great grandfather would have maybe built a house by hand because you couldn't afford to hire someone to do it or you didn't have the materials. You would cut the trees down yourself, these kinds of things. Would you say you kind of experienced something like that where you, you had to learn to do things for yourself? Yeah. So at an early age, I started selling livestock, primarily uh, priced uh, roosters. And I got them through friends and family as gifts. And then I started breeding my own and selling mixed uh, roosters that were very colorful and stuff like that. So I made quite a bit of money at a young age doing that. And then I also started selling uh, pit bulls, uh, registered uh, pit bulls that I was able to adopt that were scheduled to be put down because they're very aggressive. Hmm. So I reha rehabilitated those pit bulls and bred them, and I sold the puppies for quite a bit of money. Uh, they were uh, blue pit bulls that kind of look gray. They're very nice, beautiful dogs. Hmm. Uh, hard to get uh, for that color. And that's how I basically started my entrepreneurship uh, journey was selling animals, basically. How old were you when you first got involved? You got involved with the livestock first, you said? Yes. How old were you then? I was... Uh, 14 years old. What gave you the idea that like you needed to make money? I wanted to buy more things. Uh, I wanted to buy my own um, jewelry, my better clothes, stuff like that. Uh, be able to afford to take care of my parents. And it went pretty well when I started selling those, those animals. So do you think it was because you were seeing the, people around you, your classmates have more than you that you kind of said, oh, I think I need to like get involved in this thing. I think it was more of the peace of mind that it buys you rather than what they had. If what do you mean by the peace of mind? So like, for example, right now, if you own a business and you're doing well, you don't have to worry about whether you can, you need to buy food or gas for your car. Mm you have that peace of mind that you have money in your account and you can get both plus more. And it's that mentality uh, at a young age that told me, okay, well, if I'm bringing in more cash than I'm spending, then I don't have to worry about eating tonight. I don't have to worry about being able to afford gas or other things that I may want down the road. At 14? I, I was always ahead and I was always thinking about the future and not the now. Man, I, I I didn't think like that when I was 14. Maybe because I was comfortable, I didn't need to. I, uh, I was planning to be retired by the age of uh, 30. I'm a little behind. Well, you could afford to retire now, but but I understand. We, we spoke about it before. There's It's not about... I, I think maybe when you were younger, you're like, oh yeah, this idea of retiring is great. But then when you get to that point, you're like, actually like, what's the point of retiring? I enjoy what I do. Mm -hmm. There's no reason to stop. Pretty much. Yeah. I, I remember my, like, I guess our parents generation, they talk about it and like, they're like, yeah, we're going to retire at 65. Like our parents did like my grandma retired at 65. My dad's 65 like now. And he's he can't retire now. Not even close. Mm -hmm. And he's a freaking dentist. And he can't afford to retire. My grandmother sold clothing at JCPenney's and Burdine's, Macy's. Like she, she sold for de like several decades and she was able to retire and very comfortably. My dad can't afford to do it. So I think for our generation, it's slightly different. It does change. Um, and part of it, one thing I've noticed that those people that were better off in high school uh, or middle school haven't really done much with their life. Those that struggled more are doing a lot more with their lives today than they were able to do before. I'm going to start thinking about that when I talk to other guests, because I've never really gotten into the financial situation of the other guests going back to their childhood. I always 
think about from when they start their business until now or when they've started their first business until now. Um, Cause a lot, like some of them are like you where they started businesses at 10, 12, 15, you know, 17, 18. But I also see some of them that like they had a job and then they left and they didn't start until they were like 25, 30, 35, some 40, 45. Um, so I think some of them are, were already in a better financial situation, even if they were, even if they may have been poor as kids, but we never really got into that because it never really a- occurred to me until now about that again. Cause like, you know, when I was younger, I had anything I needed. I was never spoiled, but I never wanted anything. Mm-hmm. And so I was very, very fortunate for that, but it wasn't until I left, like when I went to college and then to Asia that I started to experience people who had a life experience very different than I did when I started to go, wow, actually like I am lucky as shit that I had what I had. And then I had the parents that I had. I mean, they're still alive. Yeah. It's like my daughter, we were watching uh, Pete the dragon. I'm not sure if you watched that movie. No, there's a scene where they're robbing uh, the bank and she's like, Mama, Daddy, why are they robbing the bank? Everybody has money. And I'm oh. like, no, not everybody has money. Some people have no money. Some have very little money. I told them you're fortunate that you don't see that with us. But at one point, we didn't have any money. Uh, mm. You're just looking at the benefits that our company has provided since you were born. You didn't see the beforehand. And she's six years old right now. And she's in the process of opening her own business uh, already. Interesting. And a lot of that, it's part of uh, passing on what I learned the hard way, teaching her how yeah. to do it better and quicker. So she'll be even ahead more than what I am now when she's my age because she already has all that knowledge taught to her. She knows how to leverage employees, uh, finances, and businesses to where she can – make an income for herself even now at a young age of six years old oh she'll be a billionaire by the time she's your age mm-hmm. i hope so i mean especially with the way inflation's going maybe a trillionaire so she's pretty smart uh she might be a little bit smarter than i am she has a high iq uh but as far as poverty and success part of it is wanting to get ahead get that peace of mind but it's also mm-hmm. taught by the parents and when you're in a impoverished family that's been like that for a while, they don't have any knowledge to pass on to you as the child on how to get ahead. Someone has to break that cycle and really study hard or work hard to gain all that knowledge. Mm. Yeah. I've heard that there's this concept where the first generation makes the wealth, the second generation enjoys the wealth, the third generation destroys the wealth. Mm-hmm. Unless you're uh, pretty good about managing like the uh, Rockefellers were. Mm. So I've, I've been afraid of that. Obviously, I don't have the second generation yet, but I've been worried about how to manage that. Um, I know my, my parents were never millionaires. My great-grandparents, like no one in my family as far as I know. Um, I mean, like there was a... So I, I had a group of four uncles and they had a like a shop together in Coney Island in New York and they sold it in the 1940s, I think for like 4 million. I think they each walked away with a million. It's all gone. They squandered mm-hmm. it all in one generation. I mean, I don't know how you squander a million dollars in a single lifetime starting from the 1940s, <laughs> like when things were like a penny. I mean, I have a picture of their shop, they were selling egg cream for five cents. I don't know how you spend a million dollars, but whatever. Um, so they didn't even get to a second generation to squander it. Actually, I, have you ever been to Miami? Uh, yes. Have you heard of the Fountain Blue? No. The Fountain Blue is a gorgeous hotel. It's a massive amount of land. They charge crap tons of money to stay there. My great uncle had a chance to buy that land for like a few thousand dollars and it was swampland still 
at the time because Miami hadn't really been developed that far north. So he said, no, I'm not going to buy this land. Well, he could have owned like a huge chunk of what's now Miami, but he didn't. So it goes to show you the opportunities that people waste because they can't see too far ahead. As you were saying before, you try to think further ahead. And I think that's, uh, again, I'm speaking from an outsider's point of view. I think using psychology, thinking about Maslow's hierarchy of needs, when someone is poor, they are stuck thinking about maybe what, you know, can I afford, can I afford to eat today? And if you're in that mentality, it's impossible to think about the future. And so it's impossible to learn the skills you need to be able to change your situation. So then you can teach your kids how to get out of that situation. Would you agree? Yes. Uh, and I experienced that firsthand with, um, I went to Tanzania and I was helping a group of females that are single mothers, uh, they're widows and they have their small businesses and the nonprofit that was there helping them. And I was there as like, a I wouldn't say special guest. I was just there just to observe and stuff like that. And they were talking about SWOT analysis and all this stuff, like mm -hmm. first, first world companies do. And I'm like, well, I told the lady to the side, I'm like, hey, SWOT analysis is all fine and dandy, but that stuff's old school. That shit don't work anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, one, they're worried about if they're going to eat today or tomorrow. They're not worried about making more money and making changes to their business so they can make more money. That's not what they're thinking. You need to give them quick, dirty advice that will get them ahead tomorrow. So after one hour of them talking, I spoke for five minutes to this group. And one lady said, why sell fresh milk? And, but everybody sells fresh milk. So there's no uh, difference between their product. I'm like, oh, why don't you sell flavored milk? What are some good flavors that people like here? Like, and she's like, oh, strawberry, mango, uh, vanilla. And I'm like, okay, we'll start making your own flavored milk. And practice uh, with natural juices practice with syrups. You can buy the syrups or powders and mix it together. And she's like, well, what if somebody steals it to me? I'm like, make a little logo. It doesn't have to be perfect. Make a logo like Coca-Cola or Pepsi. She's like, which one do you prefer? Coca-Cola. Why? Because I like Coca-Cola. Are you going to go uh, make your own and try to compete with Coca-Cola? They're like, no. They're like, uh, I, I see your point. And it, it started, they started asking a lot more questions just for me talking about for a couple of minutes, because now they realized I can brand my own product pretty easily, whether it's with their a little initials on the bottle or something, create some flavors and they ask me, what if they steal my flavors? And I'm like, well, they really can't steal your flavors because you have the recipe. They can mm -hmm. try to mimic it, mimic it, but it's going to be back like Coca-Cola and Pepsi. They're almost the same, but they're not the same. Some people prefer one and others the, the other one. And she's like, okay, we're going to try that. And they left that day very happy knowing they had a solution so they can compete without people trying to copy their, their products. That's really cool. I like that you did that. When was this? This was back in 2020, uh, November. Oh, wow. So you like went in the middle of COVID. Mm -hmm. I was still traveling. Hmm. Yeah, I I was stuck in Vietnam because I, I knew if I tried to leave, I couldn't come back. And I was living there, so I was like, oh, I'm just going to stay here and kind of wait. But that's cool that you got to Tanzania. Have you done anything else like that? Uh, we went to Ecuador to teach uh, English to people. Nice uh, too. Love it. In, in the Amazon uh, forest area in Tena. My wife went to Russia, Korea to do that as well. Uh, I think there's one more location we went to. I just don't remember. I love it. I would, I would like to do that stuff. I'm just not there at the moment. I I learned something from my first business where I went broke, doing it. Was don't like you have to help yourself first before you can help others. I've met a lot of people that try to help others as they're trying to help themselves, and they struggle to do both. So it's cool that you're spending the time, the energy to do that. And I assume like you're, you basically take it like a holiday where you're not working. You just leave the company to, to have it be run. Oh, I was still working in Africa. 
even oh. in the middle of the Serengeti, there's no cell phone reception. So I took like my sat phone. I took my satellite phone, and the workers there were looking at me like, "How is he making phone calls out here? Because there's no cell phone service there." Right. And I was closing deals with clients, uh, increasing the revenue for the company while I was still there. My company, my staff ran all the operations. But I was still closing uh, large deals. Uh, there was one where I closed the deal with the client, and it brought in an extra over three hundred thousand dollars in profit, just profit alone, uh, mm. for the year because I renegotiated the contract. Uh, so those kind of things I was still working, even though I was over there. Uh, and then I would work around usually seven p.m. because of the time difference. Right. You really never stop uh, as an entrepreneur. Oh, I know. I understand. I used to work nights and weekends. I'd work until I would go to sleep and I would face my wife's wrath. <laughs> Same here. So when you were talking to these people in you know, Ecuador and in Tanzania and these other places, did you get a sense from them that they had the ability to kind of break out of that cycle? So in Tanzania, they felt more hopeless. And I think it's a cultural thing. Uh, one thing I noticed in Tanzania was that they expect people to hand them money because they're poor. Mm. And they really don't want to work too hard to get ahead as far as the general population goes. Uh, and Ecuador, they're very proud people mm -hmm. and they don't want charity. They don't want things the easy way. They want to work hard to get uh, ahead. Uh, there was one gentleman that I met. They have, they started their own store selling eggs and beer and stuff like that out of their house, which is normal in Ecuador to do. But then he was also working during the day as a contractor uh, building houses and stuff. And he wouldn't come home till nine and he'll be gone by 6 a.m. in the morning. So, he was really trying to get ahead by working harder. Uh, I talked to them how they can do it easier and not having to kill yourself working manual labor like that. And he did see that it is possible for them to do. They just needed guidance on how to do it. Yeah. Oftentimes these people don't know, like they, they're so busy selling their own time for a pittance that like they know their craft so well, they could just find some other people to do it and then they could hire, they could find work for them and then they take a cut. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times too, what I've noticed with small business owners is that they're afraid to train other people because they think they're going to steal business from them or leave them and start their own company. Yeah. And I tell people, I'm like, you can't think that way. If they leave, they leave. That's fine. That's just how the world is. Uh, but at least they'll help you grow your business in the meantime. And you have more people in the pipeline to train and continue the cycle. Exactly. So I want to go a little bit back to when you were younger with your first businesses, you knew that there was something different. Did you try to communicate with your family? Like, Hey, like why are these kids like having new clothes? And like, did you have those conversations or was that not possible? No, we never had those conversations. Why do you think that was? It was just something that in my family, uh, you just didn't talk about money. Uh, it, the conversation I actually came up uh, a couple of weeks, a couple of months ago with my mom about mm. it, uh, how we grew up. And um, it was just one of those things you, you knew there was something wrong, but you didn't talk about it. Now, your parents were also born in America, right? Yes. So we've been here since the uh, 1800s. Okay. And uh, uh, before you guys came over, where were you from? Uh, Spain. Okay. So do you know if like your parents grew up poor and their parents grew up poor? Like, is this a thing that happened since they came from Spain? So we came, we settled in before Mexico was Mexico. During mm -hmm. the Mexican Spanish war, my family at that point, they had 
vias that had a lot of money. When Spain lost the war with Mexico, my family fled and they lost all their belongings, all their money, all their mm. land in Mexico because they were pro Spain. So they chose the wrong side uh, per se. Uh, they lost everything and we had to, we came to Texas, settled here and we had to start all over again. And that's when the poverty started uh, in our family. So like a hundred plus years, basically. Yes. Jeez. Do you, do you have any sense of the wealth they had before all this happened when they were in Mexico? They were very wealthy to where they didn't have to work. They had servants, they had a lot of land and the workers took care of everything. Is there no way to go back and kind of reclaim that? No, because it, it was basically spoils of war. You lost it. Just like any new country is formed, whoever was there and got kicked out, you just lose everything. Have you ever thought of going back to Mexico or Spain and living with servants and not working? No. Uh, Mexico is the last place I would go to. Fair enough. Like I, I was just in Spain. I was in Valencia. Spain is very beautiful might visit Spain, but if I moved somewhere, it would probably be South America, like uh, Costa Rica or Ecuador. Okay. I was in Costa Rica about mm, nine years ago. Although that's when I had my concussion. So I didn't really get to actually appreciate it. <laughs> but Panama, Panama is quite nice, actually. Haven't been there yet. Panama was beautiful until I got a concussion. <laughs> then it wasn't so great anymore. So... So you were saying that when you when you grew up, you kind of were instilled with some of these things. Why don't you talk about some of the things that either? Uh, so I guess talk about the things that your parents like basically told you. They kind of instilled in you through their words. So my dad told me I had to learn a lot of manual labor. Uh, for example, construction. He had me working at my uncle's construction company. Uh, learning how to do construction work, mixing concrete, stuff like that. He taught me some plumbing, um, taught me how to build structures with concrete at our, uh, at his house. My uh, stepfather, because my parents were divorced, uh, he taught me a lot of electrical work and mechanics for vehicles mm -hmm. and how to fix like water heaters, how to fix electrical wiring, how to run wires, how to... Uh, he was a licensed uh, HVAC technician. So he taught me how to do AC work, had me mm -hmm. up in the attic with them doing those kind of work in the summer. Very mm -hmm. hot. Uh, and one day I told my stepfather, I'm like, yeah, I'm not changing the oil. Uh, when I'm older, I'll make a lot of money. I'll just pay people to do it. And he, 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 he told me in Spanish, but he basically told me, don't be a dumbass. You got to learn. You don't know whether you're going to be rich or not down the road. Uh, that's what he told me, but he told me because he wanted me to learn. Um, right. And those, were very successful skills and also it taught me how to work hard to get what I need to. But they also told me that education and knowledge was very important uh, to, to learn. They still push education and they pushed skills as well. So hearing you talk, it sounds to me like they gave you a really good education. Yes. So what are the aspects of it that weren't great? The, from the education point? Just from all of it. Because like, like I mentioned earlier, hundred years or so ago, my great grandfather would have maybe built a house by hand. Your family mm -hmm. essentially taught you how to build things and fix things with your own hands. I mean, like, if we were in a situation where all of a sudden there's a nuclear war and, and all of the people that can fix shit are dead and you're the only one that can save anything and, and set up, you know how to survive. Like they taught you some amazing skills that honestly, I wish I had. See, they taught us, like you said, you used the word survive. They taught me how to survive, but not to get ahead. And that's where a lot of people in poverty struggle is that they're taught how to survive but not how to get ahead in life and make future generations better. And that's where the struggle really is. So where do you think they, where do you think the survival end, how do I say this? 
What was it about your lifestyle or how they talked to you or how they treated you that was that poverty factor that prevented you from understanding how to thrive? It's they weren't able to teach me anything in regards to how life really works and how the world really is, that it can be very cruel. And if you don't put your foot down, you're going to get walked all over. It wasn't until mm -hmm. I was in the military that I saw that firsthand, how the world really works. Interesting. So I, so like my father is a business owner or he was for my entire, um, life until I was like 26, 27. So I, I saw him get walked all over as a business owner. So I saw things from a different point of view because I saw that he was a really good doctor. He cared very deeply about doing a really good job for his patients. But I also saw the insurance companies walk all over him. I saw the patients walk all over him. I saw his employees walk all over him. So I learned from him that it's important to have your own business but I also saw how it's important to not be uh, weak in that regard. Mm -hmm. So he, he didn't even have the sense to teach me to understand your value and to put your foot down because he didn't do that. So I, I had to learn that stuff on my own. It took me until I was 26, 20. Well, no, I mean, okay, let me put it like this. I always knew that I had value and that my mother taught me. She always taught me you're special, you're smart, you're gifted, you're, you could do anything you want. That was my mom. And, but it, but it, it wasn't until my late twenties that I learned from someone how to understand how to monetize my value in a smart way. And that's when my life changed. But my, my mom taught me this whole, you have value. My brother taught me if you want to get ahead in life, you need to understand finance. You need to understand money. But it was my mentor that taught me how to connect value and money because the others couldn't teach me that. And, and that's coming from an upper middle class family. So mm -hmm. I think there's maybe there's a little bit more poverty in the mindset that I had. Although the interesting thing is my parents got me a, a bank account when I was 13 and a checkbook and they taught me this is money. You deposit money in, you write the check, you, you know, remove it from your ledger. Like they taught me some of that basic stuff and that was cool, but they didn't teach me like, now this is how you go and make money. They would say, here's, here's your allowance. You know, you're, you're eight years old. Here's $8 a week. You're nine years old. Here's $9 a week. There was one thing my mom did that was interesting where I was, I guess, seven and I was biting my nails. And she said, if you don't bite your nails, I'm going to give you an extra dollar per week. You better believe I'd, I had been biting my nails for years. You better believe I stopped biting my nails that day. And I got that extra dollar and she would check every week. Did you bite your nails? No, I didn't. Here's your dollar. You know, so I, I, that was maybe a warped way of learning how to make money because clearly the money wasn't being earned by anyone, but like, you know, earning it from my parents. Although they did like have me do chores and like, okay, well you, you know, you cleaned up after yourself, you cleaned this thing and, and all of that's so like, okay, you've, you've earned your allowance this week kind of a deal. Not like, oh, you're alive. So here's, you know, $5. Um, did your family do anything like that at all or no? No. They told us we don't get an allowance, uh, that we should be uh, grateful for being able to live in their house. Jeez. Okay. That's interesting. I've, I've never had to pay for anything. Although I, as an adult, when I go back and I stay with them for like a month or two, cause you know, I don't live in America, so I'm, I'm not going to like buy an apartment or buy a house nearby them. It doesn't make sense if I'm not there most of the year. Um, so like I'll pay for stuff. I'll, I'll take them out for meals. I'll, I'll pay for like, you know, I may go to the store and I'll buy a hundred dollars worth of stuff and like, okay, here you guys eat. Um, but yeah, no, they, they never like said, Hey, you need to pay rent or anything like that. Or you should be grateful. No, they never, I've heard of that. But so never had to expect that. when I for, when I started making money, I actually had to contribute to the household uh, to make it easier on my parents to pay the bills and stuff like that. Uh, so they showed me that we also have to be very responsible for ourselves and what our costs are to the household in regards to electricity, water, food, stuff like that. Uh, so they instilled within me a very good work ethic. 
uh, on there. Even to this day, I still pay for my mom's uh, stuff um, yeah. for her. Uh, she doesn't ask me for it, but I still give her uh, money every month. So she doesn't have to worry about it. Um, hmm. This is a very common thing, especially in Asian cultures, where the kids will send money home every month, even to their own detriment. Then again, I mean, obviously in your situation, it's different because you have a business. But um, for a lot of them, they work a job and they give them, you know, 10, 20, 30 percent of their salary every month just so that the parents can live a little bit better. Mm hmm. Especially because the kids can make a lot more. Like my ex-wife would make fifteen hundred dollars a month, but the dad was only making one seventy-five a month, one hundred and seventy-five dollars a month in Vietnam. So you know the parents were like, "Yeah, give us some money, give us two hundred dollars a month, make our lives easier." See, and what I give my mom is not even two percent of what I make, so it's not it's a lot for her, right. but for me it's like eh, I spend it in a day or two. I'm not worried about it, so right. she doesn't have to feel bad about taking the money because she does sometimes I tell her it's there it wants to be spent uh, and like with my daughter I've been pushing how life really is uh, like I've told her well, well if you do this I'll take you over here to the store and get you a toy she'll do it and then I'm like you know what I changed my mind she's like but you said I'm like it's not in writing where's the contract and she gets a put <laughs> you are and, going to destroy her and now she's like daddy you have to write it down <laughs> you have to write it down. That that's the deal. That, that's, that's actually like, a pretty good. That's a pretty good skill, actually. It's because if you don't, people will walk over you, and they'll take advantage of that. That it's not in writing, or they change their mind, and it's unfortunate, but that's just how life is. I'm gonna remember that for when I have kids. That's a good one, actually. That's and cool. she's learning about how employees are. She sat into uh, strategy meetings with me, so she understands what business is and she's starting to understand that life can be very cruel if you let it be cruel to you. Mm. Yeah. It's really important to break that cycle. What do you, what do your parents say about what you're doing with your daughter? Uh, they're happy. Uh, they know that she's going to be able to get way ahead than we were able to because she's getting a pretty early start in business. Mm. Uh, Charity has her, her own logo for her own company. She already has the name set up. Uh, we already have the vendors in place so we can start sourcing all the uh, materials. So she's almost ready, but she's about a month away from opening her company. What is she focusing on? She's going to sell fruit flavored bubbles that are organic and edible. Fruit flavored bubbles, like bubble tea? No, like a bubble uh, that you blow. Uh, okay. For kids, you know how you blow the bubbles? Yeah, uh, yeah. There's none that are flavored that you can really taste that taste good. And we did the market research on it. There's only two companies, one in the UK uh, and one in the US, but they, they cater to pets, not humans. Uh, so everything we source, you can actually just drink the bottle of soap and you'll be fine. Okay. I mean, if I were a kid, I would probably try to drink the bottle, I guess. Mm -hmm. They're always putting glue in their mouth and all sorts of crap. <laughs> So it's, and she's, and she, because we started this idea right when COVID hit and a couple of months ago, she's like, daddy, you're taking too long. I need your help to start this company already. So Love she kept it. pushing me for it. Uh, and you can only, you can only teach that to a kid if you experienced it yourself and you've gone through the process. Hmm. So is she a hundred percent owner or? Yes. But. A six-year-old can't form a company, I imagine. So it would be formed under me, but then she has uh, she has me running running it on paper. So you can own it through a trust, but then you have to have a managing uh, you have to have a manager managing the business uh, mm. under uh, Texas LLC. You get there's managing member and uh, forgot what the other one was. It's uh, you're not the owner, but you're the manager uh, because the trust right. owns the company and the and trust belongs to her. So technically, she owns it 100 percent, right. even though she doesn't have her name directly on the paperwork. OK, so is she going to go through Amazon? Is she building her own social media profiles or? She's going to uh, create her own social media profiles and we are going to 
do uh, sales in the park and at her school. So I already got permission from her school so she can set up a little store at the school uh, to make sales. Okay. And then what, she going to use the profit to build a website and try to distribute across the U.S.? Yes, that's the plan I'm going to guide her through. Uh, and I'm going to be the technically the uh, IRS for her. Because she's mm. not going to make a whole lot the first year, so I'm going to take taxes out. Like if You don't uh, know that. Well, we'll see. This could we'll be see a good... She, she, she could do 100 grand this first year. She pushes his heart. She has a lot of school, though. Yeah. Well, she'll come to a point where she'll go, ah, forget school. I'm going to drop out. She'll be like 12. She's like, Daddy, I'm making like millions of dollars a year. Why am I going to school? Mm-hmm. I know a lot of guys like that now. They're like 15, 16, 17, and they're like, I'm making 20, 30, 50K a month. Why am I going to school? Do they want to drop out? Well, that's the argument we I had with my wife, and I told her education is not important. Formal education is not important. Knowledge mm -hmm. is. Right. You can go to a four-year degree and still come out dumb as a rocks. Or you can learn oh, on yeah. Google or in YouTube, like I have, uh, reading books and know everything you need to know to get ahead. I totally uh, agree. I advise them. I mean, I, what I had said to them was, you know, look, I know you feel that way now, but just in case your plan falls apart and you go broke and you need a job at any point, if you don't have a high school diploma, you're probably not getting a job. So like, just, just stick with it. Just please, for your own safety and your sanity, just do it. And they're like, uh, but like, I get it. I know I hated school. I hated every minute of it. College was great. I loved it, but that's just because I was studying psychology and it was so much fun, but I can understand where people are coming from with that. Um, cause I know people who didn't get a college degree or a high school degree and they regretted it 10, 20 years later when they're stuck, not really being able to find really good work. But and, they also don't have an entrepreneurial mindset, though. And that's the thing. Some people were, like, for example, my dad. He would never start his own business. He's happy being a worker. He's been at the same job for, like, 25 years. Mm. Same with my in-laws. There's nothing wrong with that. Uh, opening a business has its own stressors that are different from being an employee. And... If you don't have that drive to keep pushing forward when everything is about to fall apart, you won't make it as a business owner because we always have issues that are major that we got to deal with all the time. For sure. Totally. As even, even if once you, if you take a company to 250,000, it's one set of issues. Once you're at a million dollar point, you have different issues. You get to $10 million. Now you have different issues you have to worry about. It just never ends. You just switch from one issue to the next. Mm. So I'm going to make an assumption here. Correct me if I'm wrong. Mm -hmm. You hire security. You hire people to be security guards. What percentage of them would you say have a poverty mindset? About 70%. Do you do anything to help them to kind of tweak their own mindset or is that like not your issue as just as the owner of the company or I've tried many times and it has not worked out. So like there was one guard, uh, this was a couple of years ago. He started at 17. He's like, Oh, 17 is not enough. I want to make more. And I'm like, I can pay you 30 bucks. I can pay you 27 bucks. Uh, we can talk about it. If you learn how to do trade work, uh, I need really good technicians that can install security alarms, cameras, access control, all those kind of low voltage uh, products. He's like, well, I don't like to be in the ladder and I don't like to be in the attic. I'm like, mm -hmm. I can double your, your earnings if you learn this trade. He's like, no, I'm okay. I'll stay where I'm at. Because he didn't want to learn uh, new skills, new trades. And I've had that issues many, many times. There was one guard during COVID. Uh, we He was making 16 with this company, and we offered him $20 an hour. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I told him, you're missing one training, and that's the baton training. It's $70 plus the cost of your baton. You're looking at $200 uh, 
uh, for that. So I told them you're looking at about 270 roughly, depending who you go with, uh, to get the certification. We'll give you three months from the time you start working for us. So you have that uh, with you. What do you think he told me? No, thanks. I'm good. Uh, he's like, if you want me to have that training, you train me and you give me the equipment because I don't need it. That's what he told me. And how much was he losing out on if he didn't invest the 270? Uh, I just did the math real quick. $8,320 uh, pay raise he gave up. Per year? Per year. Because he didn't want to spend two hundred seven. Did you did you tell him that? Yeah, he you said, said Look, that he didn't... <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Go I on. told him you're making over eight thousand dollars more per year if you do this, and you have three months from the time you start. So just I told him from the time you quit the other job and you come work for us in two weeks, that it already paid for itself, and we're giving right. you three months to get it done. And he still refused. That's crazy. If you I told mean, me I had to invest that, I'd be like, can I invest a thousand and you pay me an extra 20,000 a year? And here's the thing. He would have made it right off the bat from the, uh, the increase he was going to get with us from 16 to $20 an hour. Hmm. It's not like he had to go and take the, the money he already made with the other company and spend that. Cause I know he was struggling. You're already ahead. Just taking the new job offer. Right. So beyond that, like, have you ever tried any sort of like explicit training with them about like how to manage their finances so they can save something? Yes. Yeah, so there was one female that I had, she was a very good worker as a security guard. And I saw a lot of potential for her to be or PR manager because it was a new position I had created last year. Hmm. And she was very upset while I was having her trained by the marketing director that she wanted a lot more money uh, because she had the title, but she didn't have the skills yet. We were trying to train her in financial responsibility um, for one, how to get clients, how to reach out to clients, how to talk to them, uh, how to manage money was one of them because she was uh, going to be earning commission. And we were teaching her how the math works on commissions and how uh, if she talked to a client that brought in so much money, then you get a percentage of this from the net profits. Uh, so we're, we were starting that process and she quit uh, a month into the, her training because she felt uh, because of the title that she was going to have, she was entitled to a lot more money right away without having the skills. Uh, so I told wow. her, I'm like, well, if you want that money, go get a four year degree, come back to me and I'll pay you what you want. She wanted $27 an hour instead of 23. And she's like, well, Mr. Glenn, if that's how you think that's wrong, you should pay me 27 right away. I don't need to go to a school for four years. If that, if, uh, when other people are making that, I'm like, those people went to school for four years to make that kind of money. We're training you fast track, uh, for six months to a year. So you can start making that money next year. And she quit. And did you ever hear back what happened after she quit? Uh, she did went to go job? work some uh, a job that was paying her in, even less than what I uh, was paying her. Sad. Cause she so, could have stayed with you and be making a lot more. There's very few people that I'm able to train. So right now I have three managers no formal higher education from the university or the colleges. They just have their high school diplomas. Mm -hmm. And those are the ones that have stuck with me. Uh, they're hard workers. They all came from poverty, just like I did. And they're doing very well with learning everything I'm teaching them about business, how taxes work, how the unemployment office, how managing the money for the business works. Uh, net profit versus gross profit versus uh, cash flow. So I'm teaching them all those that information so they can take over the company from me. And they've been doing very well. And I think the common the common denominator between all those three, and compared to the other staff I tried uh, teaching, is that these three managers all came from poverty. The other ones didn't. Ah, oh, interesting. Interesting. 
So is there anything else we haven't really touched upon that you'd like to mention? Not that I can think of. Okay. Well, is there any way that people can reach out to you? Yes. If they call the company at uh, 210-996-1686, extension 100, that one goes directly to me. If they hit something else, just let the manager know or whoever answers how you found out about us or about me so they can transfer the call. If you say, I'll call later, then they're never going to bother transferring you to me. Hmm. What was the number again? 210-996-1686, extension 100. Cool. All right. All right. Well, thank you very much, Glenn. I appreciate your time, your energy, and talking about poverty. It's a very important topic that I think potentially may drive a lot more entrepreneurs than we think, just like I've spoken with people about ADD. And I think that also drives a lot of entrepreneurs, especially myself. Um, so if you know anyone that is uh, has a poverty mindset or um, may be struggling with their business or things like that, then definitely reach out to them and tell them about this episode so that they can learn from Glenn. And hopefully they can learn from some of the things I may have said as an outsider uh, to poverty. So don't forget to take care of yourself and your team. And thank you for listening. Yes, thank you, Glenn. Likewise. Thank you for staying with us until the end of this episode. We know that you'll like the other two that are on the screen now. The one on the top right is the episode that we think you would benefit from by listening to next the most. And the one beneath it is what YouTube believes is also a really good choice for you. So thanks again for sticking with us and we hope to see you on the next video.